my talk is actually around embedding the innovation ecosystem in our startup DNA. Um, I'm passionate about early stage startups and not just that, the, the actual ecosystem and building a sustainable ecosystem around them. Um, in my, in my eyes, sustainability from an ecosystem point of view means looking at it over a period of um, you know, uh, the lifetime of not just one startup coming into the ecosystem, but a, a, a sort of transgenerational uh, aspect of how we keep that, um, that ecosystem alive for the next generation. I'm interested in that very early stage space, uh, which basically means where there's no money hanging around. Um, the question that really fascinates me is how do we turn that early stage ecosystem uh, into a into a real family with a you know with a with a voice and a sort of vision on that world stage. Uh, I'm going to tell tell you a little bit around um, how we can take some smaller thinking, maybe some more local thinking, like Anna was saying, uh, and come up with uh, some bigger impact around some uh, what we're doing in New Zealand for, uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, and I hope that is useful for you if you're in startups, not just for you and your startups, but actually for the wider picture for, for building startups in NZ. So, so who is in a startup, it, just in this room out of interest? Okay, good. So, not probably about a quarter of the audience. Um, I'll also look at um, how family, children, and parents uh, play into our ecosystem in terms of their roles shaping our innovation ecosystem. <coughs> Uh, ultimately, like um, DK said, you know, I'm, I'm a startup guy, you know, and I'm, I'm not interested in that lifestyle startup, that sort of, you know, that work to pay the rent. I'm interested in that type of startup where you get an idea, you can um, build it quick, fast to execute, and then find a scalable, repeatable business model, and ideally in a couple of years' time, maybe two, maybe five years' time. And I'm actually interested in how we build that same scale into the ecosystem. I've been around the ecosystem up in Auckland for a long time, and um, that scale isn't quite there yet. We're emerging, so that's my interest in that space. So, thought firstly, a good a good point to start there is uh, to talk to you about sheep. <laughs> um, I'd like to say that my three-year-old boy drew this for you just before I left, but unfortunately, this is me keeping, <laughs> keeping you designers in work. Um, look, I've come from the UK, and I've I had two two brothers, so I'm a family of three. Uh, my older brother Simon and younger brother brother Michael um, were great at sports. I was always the black sheep in the family, and uh, you know I thought that was a negative thing growing up. Um, <clears throat> always used to get the good grades, but uh, you know I was the one that didn't play the sports. Uh, used to uh, you know I used to be labelled as the shy one, the one that mumbled, the one that uh, didn't talk very well, uh, and the one that didn't really get girls growing up. <laughs> as uh, as I'm sure you probably know many people like that. I don't know in your in your ecosystem. But I guess the, the interesting thing as well is I didn't really take risks when I was young. I find it now ironic that I now work in the probably you know, the risk industry. Um, the things I did love when I was growing up though is I loved solving problems and I loved building things. You know, I used to, um, I, the, the first computer we had in our house was when I was 10 years old and I, one of the presentations we saw today just shows you that blinking cursor forcing you to create. That's where I started. Um, and from there, and I have to admit, I used to play those sort of role-playing games when I was young, and I used to design these fascinating worlds, uh, building, building even maps and burning the corners and painting them with tea bags and torturing my little brother with, uh, with these games. But that personal vision around building stuff, um, you know, solving problems and having fun has um, certainly pervaded where I've gone through life. Uh, you know, my own, my own entrepreneurship journey, as I've learned more and more about entrepreneurship, the people I find and the startups that I run into, I find that they're driven by this same vision, you know. Ultimately, they, uh, they're looking to solve big problems and they're looking to build great products to do that and along the way they're still looking to have fun. Um, and I also sort of found that, you know, entrepreneurs themselves um, serve some similar, uh, share some similar similarities here, which is, you know, they're often black sheep in their own community because they're often challenging ideas. They're often coming against the norm. You know, people when people say no, you can't do this, they're saying yes. 
you know, especially when they're asking for money, I find. So, um, you know, I find, I find a real common sort of commonality there. My own sort of journey through entrepreneurship is probably against the norm of most people who are in the startup space. Um, mine was probably the reverse journey. Uh, the first startup I joined was, um, was pretty successful. Um, uh, so within, I, I think, 18 months of joining the startup, we, uh, we created an online community back in the UK, which for the younger members is what social networking was called back in the day. Um, so we, we built this online community and um, sort of scaled it within 18 months to, to have 2 million users on board, which b during the time of pre-Google, sort of Google, that was pretty interesting. So from there, I sort of learned a huge amount about startup and what it takes to sort of build a, a company of that size. Um, from there, we subsequently went on to a good couple of failures. But <laughs> if, if, I look at the, if I look at the more traditional um, startup journey, um, you know, building a company over time, Originally, you know, a startup has a number of failures, maybe it takes a little while to get going, and this is probably the critical difference is they fail first, and they probably fail multiple times before they hit onto something pretty interesting. But, um, you know, like they'll c continue on for a short time, probably investing a bit of their own money, get a little bit of traction, find some customers, find some work, find some mentors, maybe get a little bit more money into the company, um, you know, get some more customers, find a bigger team, and then finally they hit the right market and scale. You know, this, um, this is actually where a lot of the support um, goes because you, you know this this side of the uh, the graph here is where most of the interesting thing is you know the company's going somewhere people can look at it and they can they can say great I can see where you're going I can invest in this um, this is the bit that I'm interested in you know if you take that statistic about not a one in ten companies failing you know maybe we we factor in the few that you don't particularly hear about then 95% of this space is, is the interesting space because there's a lot of chaos here. This is the gene pool of where innovation is created. This is where the people who are creating startups are bred. And what I find is that there's no real support in this very early stage community. You know, it's often, it, it's often uh, the people in there supporting themselves. You know, I sort of compare it to it, like uh, solo parents in that the people creating these startups here don't really have that support to learn from the others. And actually not just solo parents, they're the other way. They're, they're more like orphans in the ecosystem. So like I came here about nine years ago from the UK, um, moved straight up to Auckland, um, and from there sort of tried to get my head around the, the Auckland ecosystem up there, and um, sort of learned that it's, it's a pretty emerging ecosystem up in Auckland, and like I appreciate Wellington's slightly different, but I, I, we, we share some similarities. You know, a lot of our inspiration, in the, especially in the tech sector, which is my interest, you know, mostly comes from overseas. Um, you know, many, many of our tech companies here sort of, you know, read the news that comes out from the US you know, on TechCrunch of another company getting funded, another couple of million dollars to a couple of guys doing seemingly nothing particularly interesting. You know, but um, I think one of the dangers that I see New Zealand startups looking in that space is that they read this press, get glamorized with that press, but not quite understanding the competitive pace that it takes to build companies like that. I think that's a real risk that I see in this, um, in this industry. Um, things like acceleration, which are just starting to pop up in New Zealand now, I see that as a, as a way to combat some of that, but still, you know, that inspiration from overseas is, is, is pretty prevalent in, in the, the way New Zealand builds their tech startups. Uh, I think the same thing goes for investor expectations. You know, investors also get glamorized by that same press and they expect those same sort of returns. <coughs> you know, so they're still even locally looking for that same sort of 10 to 15 times return that you might expect, you know, from a more overseas uh, startup. But, you know, look, we've got some great success stories here in New Zealand. You know, even, even recently, you know, I sort of look at in the last couple of years, Derek Handley selling off Hyperfactory and, um, you know, I think rumoured for 50 to 60 mil. mil uh, uh, wildfire social media marketing company sold either this year or last year to Google for, for 300 mil. So great, great outcomes for these, for these um, companies. But um, one of the things that I note, it, notice when these big acquisitions happen, it does inspire the ecosystem, but a lot of that company is then just basically picked up out of our ecosystem and dropped somewhere else. And, you know, you know the, real sh the real shame for us is the, you know, ultimately we lose so much talent from our ecosystem. We have a, we have a big gap. Um, we have a gap in our ecosystem where, 
you know, a lot of that talent at the sort of mid stage, you know, the people that are maybe still riding the bikes to work rather than the Ferraris to work, you know, they're not quite the rock stars yet. Um, the, people is, the people are missing and you find that those are the people that have the talent and the mentorship that sort of lead the next generation within that ecosystem. We do have quite a lot of investors here, not necessarily from the tech space, we have some, um, primarily from other spaces, but this whole mismatch is a real issue if you're trying to build your company here, you know, if you're looking for co-founders, how do you find these people? Um, you know, we hear, we hear from investment panels that the real selection criteria, that early stage, very much is the team, very much is the, um, you know, who have you, who've you got on board, what's their track record, what exits have they had before. So, so one of the things we sort of, um, one of the things that we sort of see is that, you know, that, ho that whole mentorship gap in our, in our ecosystem is, is, a, is a real issue when you're trying to start next time around. Um, I compare that to when we came to the UK, you know, me and my wife came out from the UK nine, nine years ago and we we're pretty headstrong, um, you know, like, great, we're starting the next new adventure, didn't care too much for the family back, that we left back there, especially the family politics, we're happy to leave those, thanks very much. Um, but three years ago we had a, a small boy who didn't draw the pictures. Um, and, but things change then, you know, like you can, you, I mean, there's a cliche in the startup world that, that uh, you know, your first child is like the ultimate startup and it's, you know, it's true. But, um, you know, when you're trying to raise a child, um, very much having the parents there in and around, you know, is, is the real mentorship cues that you pick up, whether the positive ones or the negative ones, you know, like I'm never going to do that with my child. Um, but, you know, just not having that there, you sort of realise that effectively you're starting from scratch again, you know, from, from the bottom up. And I see that in the ecosystem, you know, every new startup that comes into our ecosystem is almost starting again because there's this big sort of space here. What's left in the ecosystem here is that because you've got people that are almost starting from scratch each time, these are the guys that are leading it and they don't have the right experience, you know. Um, they're too busy, they don't have any money, they're maybe holding down a couple of jobs to keep things going. Um, so just the, the leadership isn't, isn't quite there. Um, there's a, there was a great book published um, recently by a guy called Brad Feld, who is probably the leading US tech investor. He's wrote a book about startup communities, which absolutely is required reading if you're an entrepreneur trying to make it here in New Zealand. Um, so he built the tech startup scene in Boulder, Colorado. So took it from a, you know, from a hundred thousand people with no tech ecosystem to basically one of the booming tech ecosystems in the US, not by size, but just by sheer activity and, and deal flow. Two things that he said in there which are really important, which is the ecosystem needs to be led by entrepreneurs, you know, um, the, and they need to have a vision that's transgenerational, you know, 20 years plus, and that's specifically why you don't see governments leading these initiatives, because the government cycle is very much a four-year cycle, and when they're not busy changing the names of their ministries, that probably cuts down to, to you know, even, even less time. So if we, look at, if we look at the way people think about building a startup here, you know, often whether they articulate it or not, they'll often have their personal vision, you know, so that might be solve problems, uh, build stuff, have fun. Um, but more likely they'll probably have a vision for their startup, you know, they'll have a vision about, you know, we do X for Y, we're solving this big problem, you know, delivering happiness, whatever it is. But, um, you know, my, my contention here is there's this one big missing piece, which is, you know, given, given the problems that we've got in our own ecosystem, you know, because we've not really grown up with that sort of culture of that real early stage support, you know, how do we change that entrepreneurship culture that we live in, which breeds really, um, you know, an entrepreneurship culture that's breeding only, breeding only children, and change it so that, um, you know, we're really you know, the next generation of startups is uh, are, uh, creating a sort of close family so that, you know, when we do scale our businesses and we do move offshore, we have got that tie, almost like a familial tie back into what we're doing. So it's not saying don't go offshore, but it's saying, you know, how do you, how do you still have that close connection back to where you came from, to your roots? And I guess that's what it comes down to for me, you know, as much as that st real gene pool of where you're starting your, your startup from, you know, how do we embed that sort of innovation ecosystem DNA into our, into our startups, into what we're doing, you know, at, at that birth, you know, not, 
not a mutation, like, not like a gene mutation of uh, another ecosystem or looking overseas and trying to find out how they're doing overseas. Um, you know, something that's formed by our own inward sort of reflection and, and vision. You know, entrepreneurs are the ideal people to do this. You know, they solve problems every day. And I think, you know, I, I think we should be looking for bigger solutions. Uh, well, I, th I think actually we should be looking for smaller, bigger solutions, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, rather than copying another ecosystem, you know, we've already we heard today that um, New Zealand's pretty unique in the way it does business, the, uh, from, the, from the way it's connected to the way it does small business. You know, how can we intentionally design the ecosystem that we're building as much with as much detail as the products that we're, that we're building? Uh, you know, like the, the constraints of allocation and the talent gap, you know, and the, the offshore exits, you know, if we were to see these a bit more as norms and just accept that that's the way it is rather than trying to see them as problems, actually get our entrepreneurs onto the case to think of, um, you know, innovative solutions around that, you know. Innovation sort of bred at that sort of boundary of, of constraint and, you know, I think that I think not enough people actually bring that into the way they're thinking about building their startups, which is why we see a lot of these problems. You know, what if we looked at smaller exits instead? What if we don't dream of these $100 million exits? What if we dream of $2 million exits, you know? Which would be nice anyway, you know? But um, $2 million is a very interesting number in that it's not enough to get you offshore. It's not enough for you to retire. But it's probably not enough for you to move to another country either uh, permanently. So it will keep, you know, could keep a lot of that talent in, within the, uh, the, our own ecosystem. Um, I think, I'm just skipping over time, but um, I think there's a number of other problems that the people within that own e that startup ecosystem are absolutely right for, for you know for trying to come up with solutions for. I think as well, if we look at the big bigger business here, you know the, they're starting to discover the value of entrepreneurship, which is entrepreneurship inside organisations. And I, you know, I ask the question: How can entrepreneurs look a bit more locally and instead of coming up with these weird ideas that are social, mobile, local, this, that and the other, actually focus in on solving the big problems that we've got in our own country. You know, and actually how can we get in companies engaging in that process such that, you know, we're actually we're actually doing that within New Zealand. We've got our first customer on board and we've got that exit to sell out to within New Zealand the first time round. That will build so much of that support system in New Zealand for the first time, it will get the track record, it will get the money back into the ecosystem, you know, it will, it will, it will uh, build that support system. So I guess my question really is how do we how do we turn that early stage ecosystem here into a, into a family that's got a, a vision and, and a voice on that world stage, you know that, that go back to my my graph right from the from the start. You know that's a very hard space and no one's addressing it. But for me, entrepreneurs are exactly the right person to be addressing that. But for them to be able to address it, they need to be building that innovation ecosystem DNA into the next generation of startups. So thanks very much. <laughs>